Hey guys, welcome back to Contest Prep University. We're gonna do a feature today, part two actually, with Austin Kiergaard, NGA Pro, title winner, and uh, a guy who right now is feeling the pain because he is just a few weeks away from the universe and in another show he's picking up along the way. But uh, last time, Austin, for part one, we talked a lot about meta issues. Uh, why didn't I win is the title of this feature. And we went through a lot of things that, that deal with how you handled your pre-contest prep, you know, all the way down to training, started to transition over from some of the conceptual issues into some of the fine details like hair, makeup, tan, things like that. And I wanted to continue for at least an, another part here and talk about peak week variables because I think a lot of times you, you are definitely in position to win and you're going to be a contender, but a lot of people don't know how to monitor and assess their entire peak week process, let alone plan it, and, uh, and they just take themselves right out of the hunt. And, and we all know that feeling of just getting to contest day, looking in the mirror and feeling like, wow, I just absolutely blew it. Right. It's, uh, I'm excited about this topic because I've actually talked to a couple of different coaches uh, in the past week about this specifically. Um, there's a lot of competitors, I feel like, when it comes to like peak week, they're like, just tell me exactly what to do at every moment. And as coaches, we need to provide that information to our people, but things change. And so I can understand if you're a client, you know, myself going through a prep as well, you want it laid out like this is how it is. But we also have to be realistic that your body is changing. And that's why we're talking about, you know, send us pictures and updates, and all these things. And so it's kind of one of those things where even though we want to lay it out for you and you want it laid out, obviously, things can change. Um, so that's just something both coach and client or coach and competitor, excuse me, need to, to look at. It's like, are you being communicated with your coach? Are you you know, paying attention to your surroundings, meaning you've been getting steps and you've been doing all these things. You're around the show venue. What are you doing? Are you sitting? Are you eating? Cause that can play into effect. You know, are you not moving like you should be like, what's going on? We need to see you. And so all these little variables can go from, I looked great on Wednesday of the show to I look like absolute trash on Saturday. And it can boil down to again, communication, um, activity levels, stress, sleep, all these things that we're going to just kind of dive into. So I'm, I'm just excited to attack this today. Cool, man. And I think knowing the context is very important. So uh, as you said, Austin, once you're into peak week and you can start helping yourself by monitoring, assessing, looking at yourself in the morning, midday, afternoon, you know, maybe documenting even with photos and different, different sources of light so you can see, you know, as objectively as possible how you're doing then you have to really know how you should be looking. You have to have something to compare that to. So uh, you may be still working on getting just a little bit tighter, and so your peak week may not involve a lot of carbohydrate refilling. Uh, maybe you've been already you know, ready for several weeks and you've been going through a, a metabolic building phase where now you've got the uh, great advantage of having increasing amounts of food. And so you gotta watch making sure you're not uh, stepping over that line into some spillover effect. So, so let's start, Austin, just by talking about maybe an overview of the different types of, of peaking that, that you can plan for. And, uh, and I'll start out by, by what I like to do. If, if my clients are in the position to move into a metabolic building phase, as I mentioned, and so food is increasing, then I'm probably gonna transition right into a progressive linear load which means I'm going to keep carbs level but linear and moving up only as much as that client can, can allow to safely make sure we reach that glycogen ceiling uh, yep. at the end of the week. And, you know, without crossing over, we don't want to spill over, but you don't also don't want to risk being too flat. So I'll give you one example of a client that did that with uh, at one of the, the big NPC national shows this year. Uh, you know, he was ready early, super lean, always in good shape and uh, slightly ectomorphic, so I knew we could, we could err on the side of pushing extra food. So as we're going through peak week, I'm looking at weight and photos, and I know if I'm increasing carbs and he's still losing weight, then I'm, I'm, I'm progressively getting behind. So yeah. I wanna make sure that we're seeing some increases in weight, meaning he's storing more glycogen, holding more water, and so 
we went all the way through peak week where we started at maybe maybe 250 grams of carbs and, and moved up 225, 250, 275, 300. We get to the two day mark before the show and, uh, and I start having to even increase protein and fat just a little bit so we're not over relying on carbs. Mm -hmm. uh, he's still not completely full and I've got some history with him on being just a little too gun shy and, and maybe not getting quite as full as we could. So on that final day before the show, we added another 40 or 50 grams of fat an extra 100 grams of carbs, even on top of that linear progressive load we had. And he did indeed wake up about two pounds heavier. So mission accomplished in terms of making sure he was actually holding more glycogen and therefore water. So now the, the place we could have completely ruined it is if we went too far and he spilled over because you really can't rectify that easily. Uh, but absolutely not the case you know me knowing his physique and knowing that that we had to get him fuller he just looked harder tighter you know everything about him was better having you know ended up gaining about three to four pounds during peak week so that's one plan and and i know exactly what i'm looking for but it could be the opposite uh i'm sure you have clients that you may be needing to kind of hold that line and and have them moving toward a tighter position instead of a fuller position yeah I've had uh, so I had a client recently where we actually played with because I same thing I, I know his body well um, but we wanted to try to bring him in um, a little fuller um, and so we tried and we tested it early but we tried a gradual you know back load loosely based if, if you will so we so we did add carbs towards the end of the week but Again, it was just really gradual. It was not this rapid, crazy thing because I knew his body does not respond well to that. He does really good with higher carbs and uh, about 48 hours, you know, in between there, he is just like on. So we knew we kind of had to change up things a little bit because he just, he has a tendency to get really, really hard, but he can kind of lose his fullness. So we had done something very similar where I was just watching him, seeing where everything was at, and we kept giving him more and more, even more than what we projected. So this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. It's like we had a plan. Okay, here's the plan, but guess what? You're getting harder. Your weight's not changing. We're feeding you more and more food, and it's just not happening. So we ended up going, I think, like 75 or so more carbs on Friday than we had originally planned, and even Saturday because I was fortunate enough to be at that show. Um, I think we ended up giving him like another 40, 50 grams of carbs and projected before he even had got on stage. And he had finally started to fill up more, which had helped. Um, and so that's just one other way that we approached that differently. Now I've done things differently with other competitors where, and this is one of my favorite ways personally is I like to have them ready early and even if possible, slightly reverse them into a show and not change a lot of variables. So, but this, this takes a lot of time for me to communicate and practice. Them. I like to ask them like, what do you look like before your workout? What do you look like after? How much water are you drinking? And the reason for that is because I like to approach, depending on what division they're in, look, approach their peak week with minimal changes, but then going into their pump up like it's their workout. Because I would always see a lot of these athletes are like, oh, I look so good, you know, shortly after my workout when I'm pumped up and sweating okay, well, what are you doing differently? You know, because if we can get you ready early and slowly give you a little more food, we can manipulate that to where you're going to look your best on stage and we're going to treat your pump up, we're going to treat all this stuff like a workout. So I've even done something where we've just gradually, kind of like you were saying, your linear load, if you will, and then mimicked their pump up just like a workout and even treated their pump up as a moderate workout because there's some athletes I know that they just look better actually getting after their pump up versus some that if they go after a little bit too much, they get too pumped up, they feel a little uncomfortable and all that type of stuff. So really, I just kind of more explained two different ways that I've approached different types of clients. And we could, again, we could screw both things up because some people are going to probably listen to this and say, well, that other option where you're not changing a lot of variables, isn't that going to really mess with, you know, the outcome? Not necessarily, not if you are, again, 
looking at your pictures, looking at how you're responding to food, getting to really know your body. This goes back to why I believe taking longer preps, you know, especially for newer athletes, because you need to get to know your body and how it responds. Um, and that goes back to the other one with the client that we did kind of that gradual backload. Like I just knew how he was responding and I even learned another thing, like he needs more carbs than we had projected, you know, and that's just things that you find out, but we didn't screw it up. He came and he brought what he needed to bring. He did what he needed to do. So those are two examples and two different ways that, you know, things could go wrong, but thankfully they didn't because we had that time to um, learn their body and learn what worked for them. Yeah. If you, if you have somebody who doesn't need to, or, or has that risk of, of being too lean where they're just not getting filled up, which, which is probably more likely. Most people are still trying to skate in, get a little tighter, get a little tighter. Uh, maybe they just, you know, have a hard time getting that, that final bit of crisp, uh, you know, look to their, their skin. Then, you know, it's, it's certainly a, a great play to just stay low key in terms of not having a, a massive carb filling either front or back load. And, and another one of my clients at an NPC national show this year, very similar. You know, we were still just trying to make sure she's going to be tight enough. So she's on 75 grams of carbs, kept that most of the week, maybe just a little bit more at the end. And then we could focus on contest day, as you said, on, on the actual backstage activity of increasing water, making sure you're warmed up enough. But, but that is more likely for more people. It's, it's to stay a little bit more stable. Uh, I certainly am not a huge fan of a rapid front load and then depleting because now you've got too many variables going in different directions and a rapid back load uh, can end up backfiring firing as well because then you're tapering off and so now you know you were really really full now you're starting to maybe spill over and now you're coming back and engaging in some flatness yep. and so you could miss it that way it's just always better to have those variables moving in the same direction mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not that much of a steep increase but Let's talk about what you brought up, which is, you know, it is contest day, and now you, you need to fine tune. You need to assess how you look when you wake up, how many hours you have before the stage, how many potential meals, and how you're going to handle that. Because I will say, you know, what I've learned in 25 years, people who are ready for their contest, peak week has gone well, they're lean enough, they're in position to win. A lot of times they don't because they're still too conservative with water. And as you said, maybe they're, they're you know, pumping up too much or not enough. But a lot of times people rely on gimmicky things on contest day. Like, you know, they, they've read an article and somebody eats something like, well, I have a stack of pancakes or I have a steak and a this or a that or I have all these things that, that your body just may not be used to. So you try that, which is nothing more than a gamble. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. You know, your body may have some kind of a food sensitivity. It may be way more sodium or less than you're used to. So I, I would never do anything like that, but rather go into it with the same meal structure that you're used to, just with the right quantities, never risking too much food on contest day because you can't assimilate glycogen that quickly anyway. If you overeat on contest day, you're just going to spill over. It's, it's not going to help to force way more food in on contest day. But the error I see people do make is, is they just don't have enough water. So if they're used to having, let's say, two gallons or a gallon, gallon and a half a day, yep. and then all of a sudden by the time they're on stage, they've had a quarter of a gallon or three quarters, and they think, well, at least I'm still drinking some water. But you end up less vascular, not as full, which means the skin is not quite as tight. And, uh, you know, you, you made the point, you know, treat it like a workout. You would hydrate extremely well. You would probably have a, a nice little pre-workout snack or even pre-workout drink of some sort that could have, you know, creatine and, and NO2 or something else. I'm not, I'm not saying do something that's, that's weird or gimmicky there. No, but, but even a lot of sodium, if you look at pre-workouts, most of them have some sodium in there. Mm -hmm. And again, that's things that I've seen people shy away from on show day. But no, I keep going because I love where you're going with this. Well, well, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned, the, the whole uh, backstage pump-up routine. And, and I do know that there is a lot of variety in terms of outcome for different people. And I typically tell people, you know, just, just warm up, make sure you're on your way up to a, a good pump before you hit the stage. Because if you're out there for a long time, 
you're going to end up just getting flatter and flatter and flatter. But I will say at a lot of the shows now, the larger shows, prejudgings are moving a lot more quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. I really only see in, in organizations like the WNBF, especially at their larger shows, where they may have pro classes out there for 30, 40 minutes at a time, that's, that's worrisome. That's a time when you really have to plan on being out there for that long. But if you're only going to be out there for five or 10 minutes, then I would say to your point, Austin, you know, get, get after backstage, make sure you're really feeling good. Make sure you can assess, you know, if you're, if you're vascular enough, meaning you're hydrated enough, are you feeling your muscle tissue like you would in a normal workout? And uh, sometimes the way you address that backstage can make a huge difference in, in a placing between first and second. Oh, it, it completely can. And that goes to if you're not paying attention backstage or um, I know a lot of athletes don't like going into like, the morning check-in meetings, but you I mean you need to go see those things because sometimes things can change last minute. You may have a sheet. Oh, this is this. The athletes meeting saying, "Hey, we're going to actually." And I've seen this. We're going to flip classes. You show up thinking you had an hour. You got twenty minutes. You know you got to pay attention. I don't care if you're a beginner or uh, you know a veteran pro. Um, and then let's say you don't have a coach. Let's say your coach couldn't make it. You're by yourself. You know what are you going to do backstage? Like. You need to find an expediter, ask them what class is on, make sure that they're matching the schedule. And personally, I would recommend people just timing it, you know, get a timer on your phone, time how long that that group is on the stage and just kind of see, okay, they're, they're taking about 10 minutes per class roughly. So I know on the sixth class, I have 60 minutes, roughly give or take 10 minutes being on stage. There's no schedule for intermission, you know, so, and this sounds like a lot already talking about, but this is what's going to help separate you bringing your best on stage. So if you know, you've got 60 minutes, truthfully, give or take a few, you can now start to warm up a little bit. Like you were saying, take your time, get warm, move around, slowly pump up versus if you're just kind of standing there chatting, Oh, what there's, you know, we're already at this point that we're, we're two classes away. Now I got to really rush and now I'm getting wind and breathing heavy. I don't have time to calm down. I barely have a pump. So there's got to be that fine line. I tell a lot of athletes, this, there's got to be that fine line. Like it, I'll do Like I'll talk about bodybuilders because I hear this from bodybuilders. Oh, I just struggled to get a pump backstage. Okay. Well, did you stop drinking water? Did you not have any sodium? You know, you may need to have a little extra sodium and water just to kind of, as you're pumping up, are you not pumping up enough? Again, like some people might need to work out a little bit, not work out, pump up a little bit harder than others. Um, but if you start early, if you start 45, 60 minutes roughly before you're going to get on that stage, like you can start to feel what's going on with your body. And so it's kind of like, all right, I'm not really feeling like I'm getting a pump. So I feel comfortable enough because I can start pumping up a little harder because I still got a few minutes. It just gives you that extra, um, uh, judgment call to make on how you need to push your body with pumping up and then getting on stage meaning to, like just knowing all of this information that that's kind of the whole point to this i know i'm kind of rambling here but the whole point to this is know when you're going to go on stage ask questions when you're going to go on stage find out that information and plan ahead and start pumping up a little bit earlier than later why because we just talked about it when you're working out in the gym, you're there for 45 to 90 minutes, maybe even two hours, you know? So I'm not saying treat a pump up for two hours. I'm saying treat that like your workout, start warming up 45, 60 minutes ahead of time, then start pumping up and then see how you're feeling. Maybe you're not getting a pump. Might need to have a little extra salt and water, take a little bit of that, start pumping up again. Things start feeling better. Now I can start pushing myself a little harder. We still have 15 minutes. Okay. I have time to just take a little breather, take a sip, keep going rather than just trying to rush everything last minute, you know, and be gassed on stage before you even hit the first pose. Cause I've seen that too, where people are like, they're just trying to hurry and push it. And then all of a sudden they're breathing and they can't control their breathing on stage. And then they're just not feeling right. And they might even be cramping cause they just, you know, they took too much of a chance. So yeah, the, the, the most common error I see backstage is, is certainly in timing. And if I could summarize, you know, your, your key points there, it would be, you know, most people, 
do end up saying, well, I think I'm going to be on stage in 10 or 15 minutes. And then two hours later, they're st still not on stage. And, and it really does come down to knowing exactly that flow. You know, you should have already printed out the order of events. Look at what, you know, class is on now. I think a lot of the big shows now, especially, you know, the, the, the expediters are fantastic. There's yeah. generally some kind of a flow where they may have TV monitors backstage or, you know, so, some way to assess that. Uh, you know, the NPC, some of the larger shows are even doing text alerts now. Some, some of this stuff is, is crazy compared to, you know, the way it was maybe 10 years ago, even five years ago. So, so take advantage of all that. But as you're staying aware, you know, one of your points, Austin, which is to start slow just to assess, doesn't mean you're pumping up for an hour. It means you're, yeah. you're doing a set of push-ups or a set of curls to see, you know, am, am, I, am I responding? Do I feel super flat? And that's generally what most people are going to see, um, you know, simply because we're way too conservative sometimes with water, sodium, and, and those, those normal things that you would do in a non-peak week, non-contest day scenario. And, and those are some of the things that are most important. And so it gives you a chance to assess early and see how you can still fine tune your way up toward your best condition. Uh, because that, that final appearance in those close calls, bigger shows are, are really everything. You know, even if you're a bikini competitor who relies on just enough fullness in your shoulders and, you know, staying, you know, tight enough, making sure you don't have any filminess or spillover, you know, that the last 30, 45 minutes backstage can make all the difference in the world. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Um, and I've worked with other bikini competitors where I've said that same thing. Just take your time because you don't want to rush this last minute, especially, I mean, bikini is a tough class to judge. They're all tough classes to judge, but you have to have the right fullness and conditioning with bikini and in natural bodybuilding, it's really like the judging panel right now. A lot of them are, you know, this girl's too lean, this girl's too full. So they're really, really trying to hone in it. And if you're a bikini competitor and you're not paying attention to when you need to be pumping up, you know, you could look too flat. So they're going to be like, Oh, you weren't full enough. Or, you know, you could be rushing it. And now they're like, well, you look full, but now, you know, you look soft because you were chugging a bunch of water and trying to get a pump up really fast because you had 10 minutes to go and you didn't feel a pump after your first round of whatever you were doing. So you slammed a bunch of water. And so the whole key points to what, you know, we're talking about is, you know, pay attention to your settings, your surroundings, the schedule, um, and, and just pay attention to the flow of the show and give yourself enough time before you get on stage to really assess how you're feeling. Again, like you said, maybe it's a set of push-ups and bicep curls. Maybe you do two sets in there just to see how your body is responding. So uh, we, we've covered so far in this little mini series, you know, all of the big things to do in the off season and even the pre-contest prep, now moving into peak week, different types of positions you may be in, you know, through peak week and how to assess and monitor that. But Austin and I also did a three-hour, three-part contest prep manifesto. That's exactly what it's titled. So if you want some of those details digging into every one of these little subtopics, that is definitely a resource to check out. But what I want to finish on for this uh, two-part series, Why Didn't I Win?, is, is that final appearance before the judge. Because th that, that's where the ink pens are going onto the scorecards and you're going to be judged right there, what the judges see in that second. So, Austin, we know that not only posing, but stage presence, the, the level of comfort that you have. If you look, you know, awkward and uncomfortable and, you know, you're just not an engaging person, how that makes people even almost like turn away from you. I mean, it's, a, it's just a human dynamic in terms of body language that if you're if you're uncomfortable, people don't want to draw attention to you feeling uncomfortable. That's actually a form of empathy. So I'll give you an example. I was with uh, Paul Ravella and one of his clients when she won the biggest NPC show in history in Pittsburgh and won her bikini pro card. And then I just happened to be in Tampa with them when she won her first IFBB pro title, qualifying her for the Olympia. And I have to say, she's not a, a you know, large frame person. She doesn't have all the muscle in the world. And so it really requires not only having that great condition, but she has to make sure she has every bit of advantage in her posing. She has to make sure her shoulders are perfectly square. Her waist is you know, in, in the most narrow position possible. 
She has to move and present herself in a way that, that just oozes winner. And I got to say, when it comes down to some of the things we even talked about last time, you know, the, the posing, the hair, the makeup, all of that together, the suit, you know, that is what makes a winner. Because I can tell you there could have been two, three, four people who could have beaten her, you know, absolutely could have beaten her physique against physique. But when you look at that entire package, she just walked out in, in the, in instantly in the eyes of the judges was the clear front runner. And I would argue if it wasn't all of those intangible pieces of her, her even down to how she smiles, how she carries herself with, with pure body language, you know, could have been a totally different outcome. Absolutely. And that shows that you were prepared and you took the time to have all of your ducks in a row from the hair, the jewelry, the, the makeup, the everything from a bodybuilding standpoint, even like the tan, the posing, the confidence, the poise. I'm going to give another small piece that I don't think competitors realize even pros having your badge number on the right side, like that where it should be, or at least presentable because nothing looks more embarrassing than a judge calling you out and saying, I can't see your number. And at a high level, they're not even going to say anything. They're just going to automatically, nope, nope, ignore you. So though you may think it's small, when you're in a competitive class, they are trying to find anything. And to your point with the bikini class, there's probably two or three girls that could have beaten her. They look great, but what did they look for? They looked for the physique, but they looked for who spent the time with, and we talked about this in our previous part one, like, did they take the time to spend on the hair, the makeup, the suit, everything was in order. It flowed together. Same thing with guys in the posing. Like, is this guy confident on stage? Is he smiling? Is she smiling? Are they, you know, are they just, are they right there in the moment grabbing our attention or are they looking awkward or doing something awkward where it's drawing our eyes somewhere else? So I love that you brought that up because those are the small things that people don't think make a big difference, but they clearly do like they definitely do. And, and that's, that's that one or two points. So when you hear someone say, Oh, I lost by a point, that point was probably a controllable factor. And if it wasn't, you know, then that is what it is. I mean, there is genetics and I get all of that, but from what I've seen in my years, a lot of times that one point was a controllable thing, whether it was posing, not smiling, like, you know what I mean? So I love it. Uh, I love that we, you know, have tapped into these little subcategories of our three-part manifesto, like you said, because I think it gives a lot of people out there that want to go back and listen to that series, um, some tangible ways and some realistic ways on how both yourself and myself and even Adam, you know, have applied these things, you know what I mean? So then it's like, if you guys want, go listen to our three-part manifesto. You can get that information, go back, watch Joe, Adam, and myself, like, now you can hear different ways of how it's been actually applied. And hopefully this will help, you know, a lot of our listeners and viewers. And, and to our last point about just looking confident, there, there's nothing that will make you look more confident than if you truly are ready. So when, when all of these variables are in place, your entire contest prep from the very beginning, how you approach that transition from the off season has gone seamlessly. You've not tried to overdo something. You've not struggled with your diet because you were pushing too far. You know, all of these things being ready early make it so you can be confident. And, and I've been doing lectures like this for more than 20 years, and I always end up coming down to, to this particular point of your look on stage because even people that I've taken to contests who don't really know the sport, especially those who know nothing about the sport, it's fun to see what their reactions are, and they're always attracted to the people who just look confident and comfortable because as I said, if, if you're not, it's not so much that somebody's marking it down like, oh, she's not smiling enough. Oh, he doesn't look confident. It, it's just a social psychology premise that, that when you look like you're there to win, the judges instantly put you right in that category as a front runner. And, and it, uh, it has an effect. It has a direct impact. 100% agree. I've seen it happen almost at every show. The, the person most times that have won, they – were there because they were confident. The judges' eyes were all clearly on them. Uh, and that goes with what I tell a lot of athletes, own the stage. I don't care if it's a fir your first time competitor or again, a, a veteran pro, like you are on that stage with other people. So if you did the work, 
be confident, show your work, and, and be present. Don't just be one of those people that falls behind in the class. Like, stay confident. So have fun. It's it's one of the it's one of the most important things. When you're yeah. smiling and engaged, shows that you want to be there. The judges want to be there with you to to share that moment of presence, as you said, Austin. So. You guys, we want to make sure that uh, you understand that this, that this particular series, Why Didn't I Win, was to really look at some of those fine points, you know, really, really put the fine point on the peaking process, the contest prep process. And uh, we hope that helps because I know Austin's going to continue to jump in and share some content with us here in Contest Prep University. Yeah. So hope you enjoy it and uh, look for Austin and I to do more in the future. You guys have an awesome time and uh, good luck with your next contest. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.